he's got some good sessions out there about marriage. I don't know if you've watched any of those. Uh, not many. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to have you here. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and our minds so that we can know you better and love you more. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, so great to see you all. Great to be here. Well, this is part three of Persevering in the Faith. And you have persevered to the end. <laughs> You've made it to the last part of the talk. And um, remember our foundational verse. Jesus said, whoever perseveres to the end will be saved. So we want to persevere to the end of our life. And in the first two parts, I mentioned a whole lot of things that uh, sometimes cause people to quit to quit the faith to quit the church to quit believing to quit following Jesus and um, so how can we uh, keep ourselves from quitting how can we persevere to the end well that's the topic for tonight we want to be that seed that falls in the good soil that bears 30 60 and 100 fold and uh, how are we going to do that? Well, um, everything I want to say is summed up in this first sentence. Everything is achieved by God's grace. So you need to build a regular routine of receiving God's grace. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And it is so true. And as we live our lives, we see it all the time. Sometimes in a second, a car accident, your life is over. And you thought you were in control. We don't have control of this life. Our life is very fragile. Any of us could have a stroke before this talk is over. And you might not be able to walk again in your life, right? We know people like that. Our ability to continue to do anything to breathe to function is is very fragile so if we're going to persevere and we're going to keep our faith in Jesus and we're going to follow him to the last breath of our life we need his help if you were a soldier don't they give soldiers training before they send them off to war I sure hope so uh, if you were a policeman, you'd get training. And do they stop after six weeks or six months of training? No, you keep training. I'm sure a policeman has to go out to the firing range and he has to practice with his weapon. If you don't practice for 20 years, how good are you going to be? And so as Catholics, as Christians, we have to continue to practice our faith. And we've got to build ourselves up in strength. I don't know what the future brings. For all of us, it seems like there's a storm coming. I think it's already kind of hitting. A lot of souls are being lost. Would you agree a lot of souls are being lost right now? Mm -hmm. we're, we're having lots of people who may have been Catholic 30 years ago who aren't Catholic anymore. Even five years ago, just something like COVID. And I know some people died from it. It was a, a disease and everything, but man, it wasn't like the bubonic plague or something that wiped out a third of the whole world. And look how many people quit. I have a, a, a brother who's a deacon in Huber Heights. He said their attendance is 50% what it was in 2019. That's only four years ago. Cut in half. 
the numbers I'm seeing across the United States, we're down to like 12% mass attendance. And it is a mortal sin to purposely miss mass on Sunday. So we've just got a lot of people who are not persevering. And we went over a lot of those things that can cause people to quit. Well, we need to build ourselves up in the faith. And in that sentence, I hope you heard the word routine. I really think it's so important to build a routine. Some of you are older than some of the others of you. Your senior citizen routine is going to be different from this non-senior citizen, this family routine that you guys are still in. You still got kids in school. You're going to have a different routine from these folks. Ann and I, we raised seven kids, got grandbabies 30 and 31 on the way. Ruthie's pregnant with twins, twin boys. I say Peter and Paul, uh, but they're not, they're not named yet. Uh, when we had a large family, when we had tiny little children, just a couple babies, Ann and I did our prayers together every day. And then you pray your family rosary, I hope, and you can only do so much with little ones because it's not very meaningful for them yet. But then they get bigger and it's time to pray the rosary. And um, you can do it in the evening. And then they hit junior high. The oldest one hits junior high. And then they have practice after school. They got sports, they got band, they got all kinds of school activities. And you find out you can't do things in the evening anymore. Uh, not like you could. So when we hit that stage, we said, well, when are we going to do our family rosary? So we started doing it at 6.35 in the morning. We only had, we had seven kids and two adults. Mom was a full-time mom staying at home, but I had to take a shower every morning before I went to school. I was a school teacher. And the kids are going to go to school. We had one shower, so I'd start from 6 to 6.10. Everybody got 10 minute slot. And uh, from 10 to 20 and 20 to 30, and then that person had to dry off real fast because <laughs> prayer started at 6.35 on the button. And we started the rosary, and we, then we had the, a few prayers at the end of the rosary. You always have to have those, don't you? Mm -hmm. And uh, our kids used to laugh, they'd say, you almost got as many prayers after the rosary as you have during the rosary. <laughs> and, um, and we'd be done by seven and then more kids could start taking their slots with their showers and they can start eating breakfast in shifts. And, uh, but that, but then we had to shift our routine again because when kids start getting to junior and high school in those days, our kids went to Edison Community College and they did college and high school credit at the same time. All of our kids did that. They had two years of free college by the time they got out of high school. They didn't take any classes at the high school. They took them all at college. And um, well, for example, Luke, he didn't have a class at Edison until 10 a.m. Am I gonna make him get up at 6.30 to pray the rosary when he doesn't have to be, he wouldn't have to get up till 9 or 9 15 I'm not cruel like that and it was time for him to learn to be an adult huh I said well Luke you can sleep in but you still need to do your rosary every day eventually everybody has to take uh, accountability responsibility for their own life and you have to take responsibility for your own prayer life. A lot of people don't do that. He started praying his rosary on his way to work, but then on his way to school. But then sometimes he would miss it. You know, that's how it goes sometimes. Lent came along and he said, I'm going to do it every day. 
and he did. He went all through Lent and he prayed his rosary on his own. Without the family, he prayed the rosary on his own every day. That was uh, 18 years ago. He's never missed a day since. Isn't that great? Mm. That is what we want to do. We want to build a routine. When you do something like that for decades and decades, it's going to be hard for the devil to break you away. We're building a relationship with Jesus. He's the bridegroom. We're the bride. You're going to have a strong marriage. You've got to work at it. And you've got to build it up so that nothing can break you apart. And that's what we want. And then you'll persevere to the end. So, now, the kids leave home. You know, as the kids leave home, well, then there was Ann and I praying together. And we would pray our rosary so many times in the car, you're going somewhere, you can pray the rosary. That's like the first thing you do when you go anywhere is you pray the rosary. Isn't that great? And now I'm by myself. That's hard. And I had to make a, a change in my routine. And I use my iPhone. <laughs> um, there's an app on there uh, that has a scriptural rosary. I love the scriptural. Have you ever tried that? That scriptural rosary where they read a, a line of scripture between each Hail Mary. And it really keeps you focused on the, on the mystery. And so I pray my rosary most days now uh, when I'm driving somewhere and I've got my phone and, and what's the next phase? I don't know. They put me in an old age home and, and I've got my iPhone and we're listening to the rosary. And, but I'm going to pray the rosary until I die. I'm going to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet until I die. I'm going to go to Mass almost every day until I can't go to Mass anymore. <laughs> uh, you might get too old and you can't go anymore. If you can build daily mass into your prayer routine well that's that's great a lot of people can't because they're still working and you're not available time when mass is being said but there are many parishes today that have maybe a mass in the evening and uh, Lormy has one in the evening on I forget which day Monday or Tuesday and and then uh Rushi used to have one in the evening. North Star has one in the evening, I think, on Thursday. Tuesday, Tuesday. If, if you look around, there's almost one every evening somewhere in our area that we could drive to. And there's one in the morning almost. A person has to work at their prayer life. And if you could build a Mass and Holy Communion, that would be great. Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Abides. That means lives in. I, 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 I heard a scholar who knows Greek. I don't know Greek, but he said that word in Greek means setting around inside of. <laughs> like you're sitting in someone's house. Jesus says, you're living in me. And he said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I abide in him. Jesus is relaxing in your home. He's living in you. Could there be anything better than that? How, that's going to build your, your, your strength up so much. Because there will be trials we talked about last week. Pain and suffering and tragedies and who knows what kind of storms 
are going to hit your house. And by your house, I mean your life. Jesus compared us to a house, didn't he? A man who builds his house on sand, a man who builds his house on, on rock. And he said, the storm hits. The storm hits everybody's house. The flood comes for everybody. Will you survive the flood? Will you survive the storm? And I don't know what particular storm is going to hit you. But we're all going to be hit. But if our house is built on rock, on the teachings of Jesus, on a relationship with Jesus, then we will survive and we will persevere to the end. I love the Divine Mercy Chaplet. I, do too. I think it is so great. And I want to share something with you that I use. It might be of help to you. It might not be. But you never know. It makes it a more meaningful prayer for me. And it just makes me love praying it so much more. You know how we have... 50 times where we, five decades where we repeat 10 times. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. I change that first us. In the first 10, I say have mercy on souls and on the whole world. And by souls, I mean all the souls in purgatory. I, I, I make it real small so it's just like one syllable so I can fit it right in there. And I can keep the same pace. Because I pray that with my phone also. I've got an app with the Divine Mercy Chaplet on there. And, and I like to pray it with someone. And, and of course, since Anne died, I want to pray for her soul and all the souls in purgatory. And, and so I pray, uh, have mercy on souls and on the whole world. That's the first ten. The next ten, have mercy on the dying and on the whole world. St. Faustina said that the... Uh, <laughs> Never mind. Your pen doesn't work? Keep going. <laughs> Go with it real hard. Sometimes that warms it up. And uh, Angie might have one. Don't worry about it. There's it's probably fine. one on the desk back. I will remember. <laughs> See, there you go. She's got something for you. And St. Faustina said, that the Divine Mercy Chaplet was so powerful for people who are dying. And there's 8 billion people on earth. There's somebody dying every single minute of every single day. And we can call down the mercy of God. And maybe through God's great mercy, somebody could make an act of contrition right before they die and be saved. Because I am a total believer in God's mercy. And if somebody, even the last 10 seconds of their life, if they call out to God, if they crack open that door just a little bit, you just make the tiniest crack in the door, the light comes in, doesn't it? And if they just open up their heart and their soul to God, have mercy on me they'll be saved. I totally believe it. They may have to do some penance and purgatory, but they'll make it in the end. And so that second decade, have mercy on the dying and on the whole world. And the third one, have mercy on the lost and on the whole world. So many people are lost in so many ways. Oh my goodness. People are lost in addictions. They're lost in uh, false beliefs. They're lost in horrible relationships. They're, they're just lost in so many ways. And they're having trouble finding God. And so I pray for the lost. Not that they stay lost, but that they become found. <laughs> and then the fourth decade... I pray for my family. We had seven kids. 
And so I start with the oldest one. Have mercy on Maria and her whole world. Have mercy on Ruthie and her whole world. All these kids are grown up. They're married. They got, uh, they've got these lives. And I'm grandpa. I should be praying for them all. And this is how I pray for them all every day. And I go through the seven kids. And then I pray for Anne and her whole world. That's basically her side of the family. <laughs> and then I pray for me and my whole world. And then I pray for the whole family and our, you know. And then I get to the last five. And there you get all those intentions that you have that you know you want to pray for. And people ask you, oh, would you pray for me? I have people do that to you all the time, right? They say, would you pray for me? And just have some heartbreaking stuff, don't they? And you look on, I'm part of a prayer, uh, an email prayer thing that we call Rack. And, and there's just so many petitions and so many people on there. They have sicknesses, illnesses, marriage troubles, financial troubles. I mean, accidental troubles. And, and you want to pray for them. And so in the fifth set, I say, I, 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 I name people. Uh, the, the first one, I won't say their names, but the first one is a family that the, the wife, only 29 years old, died of cancer, and they have two little children. And I pray for the, the woman who died, and I pray for her husband. Uh, who's, you know, going through a very tough time. And then this next one is another family where the husband died and left a bunch of children. And then I pray for a family where the dad has cancer and the son, married son, has cancer. So they've got two generations dealing with cancer. And the next one is a family that um, is just dysfunctional. They're just scrambled eggs. The kids <coughs> are adults and their families are scrambled eggs. And they've all lost the faith. And so they need my prayers. And the next one is a family that doesn't have the faith and has cancer and the next one is a, a widow who's lost her husband and she's got like five adult grandchildren who don't who quit the church and who don't believe anymore or atheist now and has an adult child who is <coughs> severely mentally ill some people have a lot of crosses to carry so you get my drift and I've got 10 of those and you have I guarantee you people like that in your life and you can just go through that list have mercy on their Kadaniers and on the whole world you know and man I just love praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet and and I put that out there for you, take it or leave it. My wife taught me that. We were praying the Divine Mercy Chapel one day going down the road and she said, uh, we had one child who really was having some real big difficulties. And she said, let's put her name in. And so uh, have mercy on that child and on the whole world. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> And you can do that. And of course you can change it all the time as, as people ask you. Um, I've told people, you're number six on my list <laughs> um, to pray for every day. And, um, and they said, well, who's number one? <laughs> it doesn't matter what the position is. Um, so anyway. The Divine Mercy Chaplet, I think, is a very wonderful, wonderful prayer. And I encourage you to pray it. So we've got uh, daily mass, 
We've got the rosary. Rosary is just so powerful, so wonderful. Mary comes to earth in these apparitions for centuries now, and she almost always tells us, pray the rosary every day. Well, if somebody comes down from heaven, and especially the mother of God, and says, you should say this prayer every day. I think we should do it. You know? And I'm not gaga over the rosary. I mean, it's not a prayer. I enjoy praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet more than the rosary. But I do it out of obedience. Sometimes you do things out of obedience. And God is very pleased with that. St. Alphonsus Liguri said that you receive the most merit or grace from carrying a cross that you do not choose. The crosses that are imposed upon you, when you carry those, that has the greatest effect. I'm not great at fasting. I hate fasting. I like to eat. <laughs> and if I don't eat every few hours or so, I get real wobbly and, and, and rubbery and like, I have to eat something. I think it might be a blood sugar thing or something, you know? And so I'm not really good at fasting at all. Uh, so I don't offer up much fasting. I have obey the laws of the church, but but I offer up crosses that have been put upon me in life. That's what I offer up. You see, if you choose to fast or you choose to do this, well, you're choosing it. And that makes it a lot easier when you're choosing it. But when it's just foisted upon you, you would, you would naturally kind of recoil against like, well, I don't want to do that. That's exactly why you should do it. Because it helps to break your will. You ever see a little kid who needs their will broken? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's us. We're God's kids. And sometimes he gives us something that will cause us to break our will. Because even when we're doing good things, if we're choosing all the good things, it's not as pleasing as when God chooses it and we acquiesce to his will. Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. Don't you think he's very pleased? Of course he's very pleased. When your heavenly father says, I want you to do this for me. Yes, Father. Isn't that great? Didn't you love it when your kids always did that for you? I thought I would get more of a laugh out of that. <laughs> Your kids always said, yes, Father, I'll be happy to do that. And... <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. So, um, build that routine. I've got other things, Eucharistic adoration. If you can build that in, that is so wonderful. There's a multitude of prayers formal prayers you probably have your own favorites my wife favorite prayer was the memorare and I didn't even know there was a memorare chaplet where you pray 150 memorares oh, wow. yeah but in the last year or so when she was dying of cancer she did that a lot you're laying there all day and you she would pray all day long And she was concerned. And I think it's good that we be concerned about persevering to the end. She had ovarian cancer. And of course you read about people who have cancer and you know people have had cancer. And she would say to me, I wonder how bad it's gonna get. 
how tough will it be? And you know the devil's not going to give up. He's going to try to steal your soul to your last breath. And she was concerned that possibly the pain would be so much and so bad and so unrelenting that maybe mentally she would give up. But she didn't. She had built herself up spiritually. Daily reading, or if not daily, regular reading. I cannot overemphasize this. In my life personally, reading spiritual things has just been a complete lifeline for me. Uh, reading scripture. St. Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And there's a lot of Catholics who don't know their Bible very well. I don't care if you know chapter and verse, you don't need that. With my iPhone, I just say a verse and it pops up right there. I mean, it tells me exactly where to find it. And many Catholics will recognize a scriptural verse, but they won't know chapter and verse. You know, they'll, they'll recognize the sentence, but they won't know that. We need to read the Gospels a lot. I know the church reads the Gospel at every Mass, doesn't it? Why? Because the Gospel is the closest we come to Jesus. It's his own words. He's speaking. And um, we need to listen to his words. We need to listen to Jesus speaking to us. He wasn't just talking to that crowd. He's talking to every one of us. And his word is God's word forever. And so we have to constantly be putting that into our mind. And you know as well as I do, you read something and five years later, you remember what you read? You forgot most of it, don't you? Studies show that students in school forget 90% of what they learn within three months. <laughs> Makes it depressing to be a teacher. <laughs> But if you keep, re there's an old saying, repetition is the mother of learning. If you keep repeating it and you keep repeating it, it, it gets deeper and deeper into you. And in this spiritual marathon that we're running, we have to constantly be refilling the tank. And so I read books that I've read two or three times before. This was an excellent book. It really spoke to me. Well, I'll read it again then a few years later. And it speaks to me again. And by the way, I've written two really good books. <laughs> <laughs> and you can read them over and over. And they're available in the gift shop upstairs. And on Amazon for all of those watching on YouTube. Uh, just go to Amazon and type in my name. And um, it's, it's just amazing reading scripture, reading church history. Um, history is so important. You know, there are a lot of people really concerned about our Catholic church right now and, and the things that are going on over at the Vatican and, and we're all, and we've got so many bad bishops and, and bad priests. We got a lot of good ones, but we got a lot of bad ones too. And there's a lot of Catholics worried. Are the bad ones going to take over? And, and um, this is the worst time in church history. Not even close, people. If you know history and go back to the 4th century, estimated 90% of all Christians were Arians. They had embraced the Arian heresy that said that Jesus was not God. Well, that's a pretty basic mistake. And uh, that went on for a couple centuries. And there were just so many bishops who had it wrong. 
that was maybe the biggest crisis in the 2,000 year history of the church. But it was a lot worse than today. But today is not over. We still got tomorrow, so who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And whatever happens, we know what the faith is. We have it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and you stick with it even if you have a bad bishop. I mean, think of those people back then. Their bishop was a heretic. Their bishop was teaching the wrong thing. Their bishop said that Jesus was not God. And so did 90% of the bishops. Eventually, the truth won out. We had the Council of Nicaea, from which we get the Nicene Creed, at least the first two-thirds of it. And then in 381, we had the Council of Constantinople, where we got the last part of the Nicene Creed. Um, but if you were living and your bishop is saying this and it's wrong, that's not a good situation. And I'm sure many people were led into error. Well, could that happen today? It certainly could. We could, um, Bishop Snurr seems to be very nice and very orthodox and everything, but he's going to retire in about a year. He already handed in his resignation. He's 75 years old, and probably within a year, we'll get a new one. Who knows who it will be? Maybe he will be a bishop who is not orthodox. Maybe he'll be a bishop like the bishops of old who was teaching something terribly wrong. Don't let it shake your faith. You know what the faith is. We've had it for 2,000 years. It's spelled out in the Catechism of the Catholic Church right now. Don't let anyone ever take you away from that faith, no matter what their title is. No one can change the deposit of faith. And never let anyone lead you astray on that. So history is a good thing to read, and then you, 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 you don't get so panicky when terrible things happen. Uh, lives of the saints. Don't you love reading about the saints? Oh, man. They're our older brothers and sisters in Christ. They're fabulous. I love reading about miracles that happen. I teach a fifth grade CCD class, and I start every class with some fantastic miracle that has happened somewhere in church history. I mean, I want these little 10 year olds to be excited to be part of a, a church that, wow. And I end class with a Eucharistic miracle every week. Every week I read to them a short paragraph about a Eucharistic miracle because that's the center of our faith. And I want them to totally believe and do you know a lot of Catholics don't believe? The latest uh, survey that was done showed that only one-third of Catholics who go to church on Sunday believe the Holy Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. Only one-third. And that's of the ones who go to Mass. And only about 12% of Catholics go to Mass on Sunday. It's Four or five years ago, it was about 22, 23%. We've lost about half of all Catholics in the last four or five years. And of those, only, only a third believe in the Holy Eucharist as the body and blood of Christ. So you guys all go to Mass on Sunday and you all believe in the Holy Eucharist, so you're the all-star team here. Now, we want you to hang on to it, guys. We don't want you to get a big head thinking I'm an all-star. St. Paul said, it, if, if you think you're standing, watch out lest you fall. We can never put it in cruise control. We can never say, well, I've got it made. I believe in the Lord. I'm living for Jesus. I'm good. No. If you're going to be that good uh, soil, if you're going to be that plant, you got to keep growing. You got to produce fruit. 
God expects us to live this life, to follow him, to be good disciples to the end. Produce as much fruit as you can. Oh, a story just pops into my mind. I got to tell it. It's so much fun. I was dying on June the 3rd, 1993, of a heart attack. It was my wife's 40th birthday. And we went to Pizza Hut. The pizza didn't cause it. Um, with the family to celebrate her birthday. We get home, and man, I got this, this, I thought it was heartburn. It was, you know, and I had had something similar two weeks earlier, but after a few hours it passed and I didn't think anything of it. And I told my wife, I said, oh man, I got that heartburn. I said, it's really bad this time. And I, had, one of the kids had a popsicle and I took it from the child and I said, cause my heart, my chest was burning up. And I started eating that ice, you know, I said to cool. I said, I gotta lay down a little bit. And my wife said, my, my uncle was 40 years old and he laid down and he never got up again. He died of a heart attack. She said, we're going to the hospital. I said, oh, we can't go to the hospital. I said, tomorrow I gotta take Maria to Columbus for a, a teenage beauty pageant she was in and and she had raised money for it and everything and and i and i said i gotta take maria to columbus tomorrow i can't go to the hospital and 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 said you should we should go to the hospital and i said well we can't afford to go to the hospital they're going to charge you a thousand bucks no matter what and i said we don't have that and then the holy spirit inspired her she said look you get the car and we'll go to the hospital which is 15 20 minutes away in sydney and she said, well, just sit in the parking lot. And if you feel better, we'll come home and it won't cost a dime. And she said, and if you're having a heart attack, we can go in. And when she said it won't cost a dime, I said, okay. So we get in the car and we go to the hospital. And then 15 minutes later, when we get there, I am hurting so bad. I know I'm having a heart attack. Mm. And I went straight into the emergency room. I did not stop to register or anything. I just opened the doors and I went in and I laid down. I, I said, I'm having a heart attack. And I laid down on the table. And they were like bees on the hive. And man, they were all over me. And they start, they take some blood quick and they do some testing and Within about 10 minutes, they said, yep, you're having a heart attack. And uh, it hurt pretty bad. <laughs> mm. And they were starting to give me, you know, painkiller in my arm. And, and they gave me that shot, that clot buster to break it up. And it works about 70% of the time. And I was one of the 30% that it doesn't work on. Mm -hmm. And so it did not work on me. And my heart attack kept on attacking and um i'm lying there and the nurse is trying to be very uh comforting very nice and and she's leaning over me and she says mr cardon you're you're going to be okay and i lifted up my head and i got up on one elbow and i got real close to her face because i wanted to make a very dramatic I thought, if I'm dying, I want to save one more soul before I go. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. And I said, honey, I said, whether I live or die, I'm going to be okay. Because I gave my life to Jesus years ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this will be it. Let me die right now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, how dramatic would that be? I actually thought that. How dramatic would that be? I said, this woman will have to believe. If she sees a guy express faith in Jesus and then he dies two seconds later, she'll have to believe. And I didn't know if she was a believer or not. But the Lord took away my dramatics. <laughs> he, kept, he kept me breathing, obviously. And um, I made it through the heart attack. Half my heart died. I, I'm, I have about 55% of my heart is alive. 
but don't worry, I won't give you a half-hearted talk here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wrong. I love the pun. But um, we have to keep producing fruit right to the end. If we love our Lord, we got to love him to the end. We got to keep following him to the end. And uh, we can never just put it in cruise control. I'm retired. I'm never doing anything again. I'm just going to. No. An 80 year old person, a 90 year old person, a 100 year old person, they still have a lot of things that they can do for the kingdom of God. And you just look for them. You pray and the Holy Spirit will show you what to do. So keep running that race to the end. Um, back to spiritual reading. St. Augustine said, when you pray, you talk to God. When you read, God talks to you. So I really encourage you, spiritual reading, pick up stuff all the time. Spiritual reading, there's stuff on your phone all the time. There's magazines, there's books. Catholic Answers is just a great resource. It's free. Most of you have a smartphone. Go to Catholic Answers. They have an app. You download it, it's free. You'll have it in five minutes and they have programs on there. Like they have one by Jimmy Aiken. It's called Defending the Faith. And it's a, it's a daily podcast. And it's so easy. Once you get the app, you just hit the little button and hit daily defense. And boom, he gives you a four-minute talk. Four minutes. It's so cool. Every day, a little four-minute talk. Isn't that wonderful? And there's a thousand things like that out there. So constant uh, reading and listening. Uh, you're, you're obviously great because you've come to a talk on the faith. And so this is the type of thing you need to do. Just keep, I, I find that I, it's not that I have to learn anything new. I just have to repeat constantly the things that I know. And that's what people do. A soldier does training. He's not doing new things all the time. Uh, a policeman is doing training. A teacher is doing training. They're not always doing new things. You're just keep those skills up and keep that relationship up. Uh, participate in family activities, uh, in parish activities, according to your state and life. Again, what you can do in the parish and what somebody else can do in the parish we are the body of Christ, huh? And we've got to be connected to the other members of the body of Christ to some extent. And during different phases of your life, you can do different things. But just be connected to the parish somehow. Uh, serve your family. There's no place better to serve God than in your own family. Mother Teresa, a wonderful saintly person, she said, you can find the poorest of the poor anywhere in the world. She said, many of them are in your own family. She said, you just have to see them and then serve them. Sometimes we're blind to people who need us and they're very close to us. There was a story about uh, a man, it was a pretty famous man, I forget who he was, but he wrote down, took my son fishing today, a wasted day. And the son wrote in his diary, my dad took me fishing today, the best day of my life. Sometimes it's right there next to us. And we don't see the need. Let us pray that God gives us the eyes to see those people in our life who need our love, who need our service, 
because they might be right there at the table with you. And we have to provide for our families. We have to serve them. 1 Timothy 5, 8. St. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, Whoever does not provide for relatives, and especially family members, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's really strong language when you listen to that. Whoever does not provide for relatives and especially family members has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do you have a relative or a family member in a nursing home? You need to see them sometimes. You need to visit them sometimes. One of my kids, when he was a young adult, he was single and he had time. And so he volunteered to uh, go to a nursing home and just read a book to an elderly person. And he said, you can't believe how many people in nursing homes never get a visitor. The, the, the man that he was reading had children who lived in that town. They lived no more than three miles away. And they never visited him at all. Your dad is three miles away in a nursing home. And you never go visit him? How can you say the love of God is in your heart? If you do not love your neighbor who you can see, how can you say you love God who you cannot see? St. John said. Right? So, we need to serve our families. We need to take care of our families to the best of our ability according to our state in life. And we, there is no better place to love Jesus than in your own family. Of course, we, we expand beyond that, but we take care of our family. Uh, serve the community according to your state in life. Whatever you did for the least of my brethren, you did for me. So, as we volunteer, as we work in the community, we're serving Jesus. We're building up our faith. Absolutely. Your relationship with Jesus will become that much stronger as you serve the least of my brethren. You serve the needy. You serve whoever. You all have different skills. You all have different talents. You all have different schedules. But it would be good to volunteer somewhere, somehow, some way. Again, according to your state in life and according to your routine, and routines change. You just constantly get back to your routine. I don't know how many of you love a routine. I do. Do you ever feel like, oh, I'm glad to be home from vacation. Now I can get back to my routine. <laughs> um I think you can really have a spiritual life that way. It's really a beautiful thing. And finally, um, use your money to serve God. You know, there are people who would do a lot of stuff, but they don't want to ever give away any of their money. <laughs> they really hang on to that, baby. It's a mindset. Whose money is it? It's God's money. You say, but I worked for it. I earned it. God gave you existence. God gave you the body that functions. God gave you the opportunity. God gave you the freedom of a country. God gave you the motivation. God gave you the parents who taught you how to work. God, God has given you every bit of of everything you have ever earned has been a gift from God. And the sooner you recognize that, the better. 
because then you'll become a person filled with gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I had the ability to get up and get out of bed and to go to work today. Because without God's blessing, you wouldn't be able to do it. So everything's a gift. And our money is a gift. And when we use our money, and I'm not telling you what to give or who to give to or how much to give to, let the Holy Spirit guide you. But give. Give some of your money. Putting money in the game builds that relationship. It really does. It really does. Ann and I first got married. And she said, I would like to have a, like a certain allowance, like mad money. I, we had no money. We were, we were. We didn't have much money in life. I worked for the Catholic Church, so I'm below poverty level. <laughs> and um, I said no. I got the checkbook out of the out of the desk, and I put it on the table, and I said, "There's all the money we have in the world right there." I said, "It's all yours, and it's all mine." It's ours. I said, that's it. You can do anything you want to with it. I said, but there's nothing that's just yours or just mine because we're married. The two become one. I said, so it's all yours, honey. You never had such a good wife in your life. She would not spend anything that she didn't feel like we really had to do it. She was very fiscally responsible. It, because she knew this was part of our life together. Well, how about you and your heavenly bridegroom? Can you just use your money for willy-nilly? No. It's God's money. It's your money. It's you and your heavenly spouse. So use it in a fiscally responsible manner. <laughs> do with it what Jesus would do with it. And let the Holy Spirit guide you. Well, to finish it up then, we've been talking about uh, your spiritual garden, huh? And the seed that falls in the so shallow, rocky soil, some of it dies because of persecutions. We never want to please men. We want to please God. So hang on to the truth. And then uh, we've got the last part two where we have the, the weeds that grow up in our garden and choke out the plants. And we mentioned all those different kind of passions and desires and things that people end up following that. They love sex more than they love God. So they end up defying God's rules and living for that instead of living for God. So in our garden, we need good fence around the garden. A few years ago, I thought I'm going to plant a bunch of sweet corn and we'll freeze a bunch of it and we'll have enough for a couple years. Well, wouldn't you know, I didn't put an electric fence around it and those dad burn raccoons <laughs> We went away for a few days, and when I came back, those raccoons ate all 700 ears of corn. I would, I would get about 100 ears off each row, had seven rows. I did not get one ear of corn out of that garden. Those little guys, those bandits, they took it all. We need good fences around our spiritual garden. What are they? God's commandments, the laws of God, the commandments, the laws of the church. Do not fudge the laws. Don't put an opening in the fence or you'll lose all your fruit. So good fences, we obey the laws of God. We acknowledge that God's ways are the right ways and we never compromise it. We love sinners, but we hate sin. 
and we have to call sin, sin. And God tells us what's right and wrong. So those are our fence. That keeps the raccoons out. And we've got to water our plants. And that's what we've been talking about this evening. Mass, Divine Mercy Chaplet, Rosary, daily prayers, serving others, serving the community, serving our family. All the things we just mentioned. That's the daily watering. And just make sure our plants have a... But you got to keep those weeds out. And, and that's confession, 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 confession. Go to confession as often as you need to. Everybody needs to, I think, bare minimum once a month. This week is First Friday and First Saturday. It's always a great thing to go to confession before First Friday and First Saturday. Also, beautiful devotions, huh? First Friday devotion, First Saturday devotion, so wonderful. You are so blessed to be Catholic. You are so blessed to have a hundred different ways of building yourself up in God's grace, just like that. First Friday devotion brought to us by St. Margaret Mary in the 1600s, and First Saturday devotion brought to us by Our Lady of Fatima in, in the 1917 and, and a little bit after that. Um, We've just, God just gives us so many wonderful ways to grow in his grace. And so you got to keep watering your garden, but you got to keep going to confession. You got to keep the weeds out. And if you go to confession, I try to go every two weeks. Um, every week is wonderful. John Paul II went to confession every day. He went to confession every day when he was Pope. I don't know. I don't think I can handle that. Um, but I go every couple weeks. But go as often as you need to. And if I ever do something that makes me feel bad, maybe you say something uncharitable, and later you think, oh, well, I shouldn't have done that. And it makes you feel bad. So I go to confession. And you say, well, why go to confession? Well, God has told us this, but on a general principle, what does scripture say? What does Jesus say? He says, humble yourself and God will exalt you. I can't think of a better way of humbling myself than going into the confessional, looking at that priest and saying, I sinned. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And I'm sorry. Isn't that a great way to humble yourself? Do you notice when Jesus was speaking, whose job it is to make you humble? Your job. Humble yourself. It's something that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to humble yourself. And God will exalt you. I think some people are just waiting for God to humble them. No. You're supposed to do that part yourself. Humble yourself. And God will exalt you. Going to confession is so good for you spiritually. It is so good for you. So very much a routine. Have a routine. And before you go to confession, pray. Examine yourself as good as you can. And you try. This is what I try to do. You try it. Think, if this is my last confession that I can ever make, maybe I'll die of a heart attack. See, I've had two heart attacks, so I know how it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're thinking life is all good, and then a minute later, you're like, oh, baby, I'm dying. <laughs> so that's a great gift, too. To come that close to dying is such a great gift. Because it just puts your antenna up and you like, oh. So before I go to confession, I think, Henry, if this is the last chance you have to confess before you die, what would you say? And then I go in and I say it. It just makes for a wonderful confession. And it just helps keep the weeds down. And then God is the sunshine, and he will make your garden grow. 
Without him, if there was complete darkness, would anything grow? No. Mm. God is the sunshine. He makes the garden grow. His, his laws keep the animals out. His grace waters your plants. Your humbling yourself keeps the weeds out. And God gives the sunshine and you produce fruit. And it's just like the garden of paradise. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you so much for the gift of faith. Thank you so much for your love and for entering into this beautiful relationship where you are the groom and we are the bride. Thank you so much for your constant love for us. Dear Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Without your Holy Spirit, without your grace, we cannot do anything. Please, Lord, every day, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can stay faithful, so that we can persevere, so that we can keep putting one foot in front of the next one, even when it is so difficult, even when we're so tired, because we want to finish the race. Give us the grace of final perseverance, no matter what we might have to go through. Be merciful to us, Lord. Don't give us any more than, than we can handle. And give us the grace to get through all the things that we can't handle. Thank you so much, Lord, and help us persevere to the end because we love you and we want to spend eternity with you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, it works great. Um, Henry, I wanted to ask.